This lecture is going to cover pediatric cochlear implant candidate selection. This is related back to chapter 3 in the textbook, Cochlear Implant Patient Assessment, Evaluation of Candidacy Performance and Outcomes, and this chapter is by Renee Gifford. In the last lecture we talked about adult cochlear implant candidate selection, so in contrast pediatric uh, candidate selection is not quite as straightforward. Um, it hasn't been around quite as long, albeit it has been around quite a long time. Uh, whereas uh, uh, pediatric, co I'm sorry, adult cochlear implant candidate selection really I think was approved in 85 by the FDA. It wasn't until June 1990 that the FDA approved these multi-channel cochlear implants for children. And that's a pretty common uh, trend that you'll see. And, and this is true for cochlear implants or, or Baja, things like that. When we, we often see uh, changes in indication or uh, for, for example, I don't know, single-sided deafness for cochlear implant, or if we see um, like, like the hybrid cochlear implant, we're typically going to see these approved in adults first before children. Um, and so that's kind of a common thread that you're going to see across many of these devices or indications for these devices. Um, so let's talk about candidacy criteria. So some of these things will be the same as they were for adults. Some of them are, are going to be addition, uh, additional to what we saw for adults. Some of the things that are relevant are going to be age of implantation. Of course, this isn't critical for older adults. We talked about older adults. Even the oldest old can typically benefit from cochlear implants, whereas we're talking about age here is how young can we implant them. And usually the general idea is the earlier the better, uh, but there are um, age age criteria for uh, co pediatric cochlear implantation. Etiology of hearing loss, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, if we have a known etiology, I guess is the key thing there. Uh, just like we mentioned last time, cochlear implant manufacturers will each have their own indications. Uh, the manufacturer proposes those and the FDA approves them. Um, the auditory related milestones are something new to add to pediatric cochlear implant. When I say new, I don't mean new it's only recently come into play I mean they're new in terms of uh, I should have said different different than adults of course different we don't have auditory related milestones uh, we have you know speech recognition scores um, for adults but not auditory related milestones uh, similar to adults there's medical radiologic psychological considerations I think the psychological and then speech and language considerations are going to play a bigger role for children than they do for adults with kids who are going to be potential cochlear implant candidates, there's going to be an, uh, an existing, a pre-existing uh, established history of audiologic testing, right? We're typically going to start with newborn hearing screening, and a lot of these kids are going to end up referring on their newborn hearing screening, coming back for diagnostic evals, including uh, frequency-specific ABR threshold assessment. Uh, they're going to have OAEs. We may, you know, depending on the age, if they're older than six months, there may be some behavioral uh, behavioral measures available and of course uh, when we talk about pediatrics we can certainly talk about um, kids who are getting cochlear implants later on they could get you know at 14 years of age maybe they're longtime hearing aid users and for whatever reason they you know they, they wanted to wait until they were older a teenager or uh, tween in order to get a cochlear implant um, so that's a possibility so I guess you're gonna see some diversity there in terms of the uh, backgrounds of these kids but regardless of their previous history, uh, the cochlear implant center is going to want to conduct their own testing. They're going to want, especially if these kids are younger, uh, they're going to want to try to get more information, more information, because we know with pediatric assessment, you're not always able to get everything you want to get. Um, so, for example, starting at around six months, you may start to have the cochlear implant center doing behavioral testing. It's certainly possible that maybe an ABR was the only uh, type of threshold assessment previously um, conducted. Uh, or maybe there were, was behavioral testing, but it could only be completed at 500 and 2,000 hertz, and so you just want to get more information. So at a minimum, uh, the cochlear implant center, you'll see them do behavioral audiometry, emittance. Emittance would include um, um, a tipidometry and acoustic reflexes, and then OAEs. Um, your typically behavioral audiometry, not ABR, you know, I guess unless there's issues with, with development where you can't, uh, where they're delayed, where they can't conduct behavior, behavioral audiometry, because most of these kids are going to be a uh, minimum of six months before before uh, being evaluated for cochlear implant candidacy. When we start talking about audiometric threshold criteria for cochlear implant candidacy, we can see that it's um, 
a little bit um, more rigorous or conservative, I guess, uh, is probably a better way to put it than adult cochlear implant candidacy. Again, I talked about how things are typically approved in adults before children. When we see criteria loosening up, we usually see them loosen up in adults prior to loosening up in children. Um, we can see the implant manufacturers each have their own criteria, but roughly for children who are uh, 12 to 24 months, uh, then there, it's going to be required bilateral profound hearing loss, sensorineural hearing loss. It doesn't, that statement that I'm making from the text doesn't seem to be entirely reflected by the table here, so I don't know if, um, if maybe it just is uh, not quite accurate in the table, but this is from what the text is stating, that um, between 12 to 24 months, all three cochlear implant manufacturers require bilateral profound loss. And some of that, it sounds like, stems from the concern as far as reliability of behavioral testing that, for example, um, if the child had severe loss and it was, if it was overestimated, um, then, then, and it was overestimated to be a profound loss, then the child would have been implanted having a true severe loss, and that's not a big, big error, truthfully. But if the child only had a moderate hearing loss and it was overestimated, by mistake to have a severe loss, then uh, maybe that child shouldn't have been planted. They may have done better potentially with hearing aids. Um, so that was one of the arguments made. Um, it sounds like that's probably not quite as much of an issue nowadays here. At least in the author's opinion, there are uh, plenty of checks and balances in place uh, in order to prevent that from happening nowadays. I, I don't really have any personal opinion on that. And right now, the minimum FDA-approved criteria for children is 12 months, but there's some arguments that are being made, uh, apparently, to try to lower that age, minimum age, to around 6 to 9 months. And so if, you, if you've heard of cases where children are already being implanted under 12 months, uh, that doesn't mean it's illegal or anything like that. It just means that it's being done off-label, kind of like prescription medications but can be prescribed off-label, so that it's not following the FDA indications, and that's perfectly fine. Then the main concern would be insurance reimbursement, and insurance companies may or may not have, uh, for example, those age restrictions. The, the main argument for trying to get these kids implanted earlier, say for example six to nine months as opposed to the minimum of 12 months is, is potential improved outcomes and there is a little bit of research to support the idea in terms of uh, speech perception, speech production intelligibility, vocabulary development, um, uh, typically all these things, language acquisition, these things are going to be typically improved the earlier the child is implanted. Okay, let's move on to speech recognition testing. So just like audiometric threshold, speech recognition testing is an important part of determination of cochlear implant candidacy and also really tracking outcomes in this case. Uh, similar to adult cochlear implant uh, candidacy determination, it's important to use recorded materials uh, for speech recognition testing for the same exact reasons that it's important to do in adult patients. It's more reliable. You can compare results across clinic, etc. Another thing to point out would be because of the population we're dealing with, typically those with severe to profound hearing loss, they rely much more heavily on visual cues. And so if they're engaging in, you know, let's talk about an older child, for example, if they're engaging in conversation and they seem quite successful in doing that, uh, they're probably relying heavily on visual cues, and that doesn't really give you much insight into their auditory speech recognition abilities alone. So we need to take away that visual information, uh, and to some extent uh, contextual information, and rely on, uh, for example, word recognition abilities and uh, to determine what their auditory related abilities are. Now it's true that not all pediatric speech tests are available in recorded versions. What we can say is really the most important ones are, are the ones that we're going to use to determine hearing aid candidacy or the ones that we should be using to track uh, changes uh, due to implantation or due to time. Uh, we should be using recorded materials for that, those purposes. Now two popular tests that were designed specifically for pediatric cochlear implant uh, candidates were the uh, lexical neighborhood test, LNT, and the multisyllabic lexical neighborhood test, MLNT. These are two tests that I don't think you typically see outside of the realm of uh, 
cochlear implants, but I suppose I could be wrong on that, but I definitely know they were designed with cochlear implants in mind, and that's how they became uh, popularized. Now, th there may be certain select cases where you may need to use uh, live voice materials uh, testing a child. These cases may involve um, children who are less responsive, say, to the recorded material, um, or maybe you need flexibility uh, that isn't available as well with uh, recorded materials. So, like I said, there are going to be certain cases where you may need to use live voice, but it should never be the go-to. It shouldn't be the first choice. Recorded materials should typically be tried first before reverting to live voice testing. Um, live voice scores are typically going to be better than recorded uh, scores, and usually the reason they're going to be better is related to um, uh, greater greater abundance of supersegmental cues. Uh, the supersegmental cues, for example, are going to be typically more exaggerated. Um, prosody, for example, uh, when when the uh, pediatric audiologist is is articulating those words, typically there's a slower rate of speech. If we're uh, talking about, say, sentence material. And so for those reasons, we're typically going to see higher scores because in contrast with recorded materials, we're looking for uh, natural speech without uh, you know, uh, atypical inflection. Since many of you may not be familiar with the, uh, the lexical neighborhood test or the multisyllabic lexical neighborhood test, I'll try to go over that a little bit and give you some context uh, to better understand it. So the first thing would be to talk about why it came into being. So the authors of this test were, um, uh, I think, Kirk and Pisoni and Osberger. Pisoni's a famous uh, speech scientist. And, and, uh, and uh, Pisoni, so the three here uh, cited uh, previous research studies uh, by Osberger and Stoller, which found that cochlear implant recipients basically uh, didn't do very well on this test at all. I'm sorry, not this test, uh, the PBK-50s. If you look on the left side, that figure on the left side, what you'll see is percent correct for um, co pediatric cochlear implant recipients uh, for PBK-50s, uh, comparing to the lexical neighborhood test, the hard words, and then the easy words. I'll get to the distinction between the hard words and the easy words, but right away you can see that for even the lexical neighborhood test hard words, scores are higher than for the PBK-50. So, so the, the impetus for creation of these, this LNT test was that even post-implant, even with experience, these cochlear implant recipients were getting, you know, uh, along the lines of 8% or 11% correct post-implant. So because they're basically riding around the floor of the test's uh, performance, it, it basically it's, it's not, it's not going to be very appropriate for this population. So let me give you a better description of uh, what separates these easy words versus the hard words. And you can see there's a, there's a graphic on the right-hand side to help uh, describe this. Uh, the distinction between the two is based heavily on uh, the neighborhood activation model of spoken word recognition. The, the two basic parameters that separate the easy words from the hard words are going to be word frequency and lexical similarity. So when we think of word frequency, we're talking about how many, how often it's used in the English language, right? There are some words that are much more common than other words. Uh, so word frequency, the more common the word, the easier it typically is. The other key factor is going to be lexical similarity. So when we say lexical similarity, we're thinking about how many words that are basically uh, the exact same in terms of acoustic phonetic uh, acoustic phonetic makeup, uh, except they're different by one phoneme from the target word. So the more the more neighbors they have that are very very similar, uh, the more difficult the word is going to be. So in the graphic in Figure One on the right side, the easy word, uh, the black line. Imagine the height of that as word frequency. So very frequent words are easy, and on the hard side, that black bar is lower. The thick black bar indicating. Uh, the words are less commonly used in the English language. 
and then the, the neighboring thin bars represent the uh, lexical similarity or how many neighbors they have. So you can see there's very few neighbors to confuse the word with under easy words, whereas under the hard word, there's many neighbors uh, to confuse the word with. So think about it this way in terms of the, uh, the number of neighbors they have. Think of a word like cat. There's going to be many, many uh, neighbors that are lexically similar to them. Cat, you've got rat, hat, bat. Um, cab, uh, so just many, many, many words that are very similar to them. And another word might be pal. I think pal has far fewer lexical neighbors. We might have uh, pat, uh, par, I guess par wouldn't even be a lexical neighbor, it's two phonemes that are different, but I would say pal has uh, fewer, fewer lexical neighbors than something like cat. And then those same authors in the same study also created a multisyllabic version of this lexical neighborhood test. Again, broken down into easy words and hard words based on the parameters that I just described. Um, which you can see though in general here is the multisyllabic word lists are easier than the monosyllabic word lists. So the multi multisyllabic lexical neighborhood test is easier than just the lexical neighborhood test. So for uh, MEDEL's uh, speech recognition and auditory skills candidacy criteria, they specify less than 20% correct on either the MLNT or LNT, depending on cognitive ability and linguistic skills, and that's for older children. And presentation level, I think, similar to what I talked about in the adult cochlear implant candidacy lecture, uh, 70 dB SPL or DBA had been used historically, uh, but there's a recent, more recent trend to use a lower level around 60 dB SPL, and that's because it's more representative of conversational speech. And I think we're also to see greater change, overall greater benefit in terms of speech understanding abilities. So the table you can see below in this slide uh, is from Pearson's 1977. This study was uh, commissioned by, I think, the government, uh, EPA maybe, um, in order to uh, basically determine the correlation between vocal effort and, um, and SPL level uh, for that speech. And we can see for normal speech, basically conversational speech, we're right around 60 dB SPL on average, a little bit lower for women, but uh, right around 60 or so. Whereas the 70 dB SPL is closer to somewhere between raised and loud speech, or in terms of uh, speech with a raised or loud vocal effort. So usually with kids, um, when, when establishing cochlear implant uh, candidacy, they'll probably be seen over a longer period of time uh, prior to implantation compared to adults. And one of the reasons is they're completing the hearing aid trial to see if the uh, hearing aid trial is unsuccessful, because that's one of the uh, criteria that uh, needs to be met. So usually over a three to six month period, uh, they're going to do speech recognition testing, uh, serial speech recognition testing. And of course, there are going to be special cases where that trial needs to be shortened. And uh, an obvious example would be meningitis. So after meningitis, the cochlea ossifies, and so they need to get in there right away to implant uh, the electrode array. Um, other cases may be where there's progressive or sudden hearing loss in older children, or some of those kids are just not progressing adequately in terms of speech language development. All of those reasons may play, uh, have a, a part in shortening the hearing aid trial. Of course, we'll use different speech recognition tests um, for some of these youngest kids. So for example, children under three years old, uh, I think you're pretty familiar with some of these tests that are commonly used in pediatric audiology. I think Dr. Downs taught you about these tests. You've got the new chips for the youngest kids, about two and a half to five years old, and the WIPI for kids three to five years old. These are both closed set tests. And these are not used for candidacy determination as much as they are used for tracking and, and evaluating performance over time. Because these are closed set tests and because some of these younger kids may be nonverbal or they may not be uh, intelligible in terms of being able, the audiologist being able to accurately score them, correct or incorrect, these are going to be, usually have uh, picture pointing associated with them. And so the, uh, the WIPI book is going to have six pictures 
pictures per, um, you know, five foils per target word or six pictures total. And the new chips will have four pictures total. And so that means that um, chance performance will, uh, you know, be reasonably high in compared to an open set test. So open set test, we shouldn't really have chance performance uh, with a closed set test because random guessing can typically help here. Um, chance performance be 25% for the new chips and 16.7% for the whippy. That's just taking the total number of, um, uh, of items you have on each page, like six items. Uh, so divide 100% divided by six or 100% divided by four for the new chips. Um, so the key thing here is if they're getting scores below chance, then it's, uh, you're getting into the floor of the test performance and it's not going to be terribly useful in terms of discrimin discri discriminatory power. There's a couple other tests that were mentioned in the book, the CRISP and the CRISP Junior. I wasn't really familiar with myself. Uh, well, obviously the junior port, the crisp junior is going to match up a little better with the new chips in terms of age and the crisp matches up a little bit better with a whippy. But it, it seems that the crisp is one, a computerized assessment test where it's kind of a uh, game like uh, interaction so the children may be uh, more interested in completing the test and maybe have uh, uh, greater reinforcement properties. Um, but these are mainly used in order to determine SRTs. Uh, so quite useful, a nice nice uh, adjunct or uh, uh, complementary test to the new chips or the whippy because those are there to determine super threshold word recognition, whereas the CRISP and CRISP Junior are there to develop uh, are there to determine SRT. I believe in th there's the CRISP is going to use 25 spondees, and the CRISP Junior is going to use um, uh, objects or body parts, which is uh, also kind of a common trend in general for these younger kids. So that seems pretty reasonable to me. Um, I believe you're also able to determine performance in background noise. So, we, of course, you know, the regular SRT is, is of more critical uh, nature to cr as a cross-check to the audiogram. But performing the SRT in noise would be like a speech and noise test. This would be like, you know, equivalent to something like the hint. So, nice test. I was looking to find out where it can be purchased from, but I was having a hard time finding out where that, where to obtain that test from. Uh, but if you, you know, have that available to you down the road, uh, from what I can tell, it looks like a great test to try to employ. For uh, children who are older than three years old, we're typically going to be using uh, open set word recognition testing. Uh, the specific tests that are labeled by the various cochlear implant manufacturers uh, in their in their FDA inserts um, are basically listed below here: early speech perception test, multisyllabic lexical neighborhood test, lexical neighborhood test, phonetically balanced kindergarten uh, word list, and the hint for children. Um, these are listed in developmental order, so for the youngest children on top down to the older children on bottom. Uh, we've already talked about the uh, lexical neighborhood test and the multisyllabic lexical neighborhood test, and I think you're already familiar with the PBK test from your um, uh, experience testing children more generally. Um, the hint C is going to be the hint test. I believe it's presented in quiet, um, but it's going to be some of the easier sentences. Uh, selected from the, uh, uh, I believe the Bamford Cowell Bench uh, list, or the Bar I'm sorry, Banful Coward uh, Bench Cowell Bamford list, and those are actually selected from the same uh, li same types of sentences that you see in the BKB sin. So I think you're familiar with the BKB sin. It's a, a similar, more uh, similar test to the quick sin, but with greater con contextual cues. Uh, it's a kind of a pseudo-adaptive uh, uh, speech understanding and noise test. So we're, we're establishing a um, DBS and R threshold, or essentially DBS and R loss, and we're comparing it to um, normative data. Uh, so this is one that's easy enough where you could certainly do this in children with cochlear implants. Uh, and there's kind of a, the, at least the author believes that's a pretty good idea in this case. Um, but it's not specifically listed by any of the cochlear implant manufacturers. Definitely not listed for candidacy. But it seems to be the direction that things are going in to incorporate some more speech and noise testing. And the BKB sense seems to be a popular choice. 
it seems that the cochlear implant manufacturers uh, are a bit more restrictive uh, with children compared to adults in establishing uh, word recognition performance required to meet cochlear implant uh, candidacy criteria. So when I say more restrictive, I mean they have to have lower scores on these tests like the HINT, for example. Um, and that's consistent with what I've already mentioned about uh, FDA candidacy criteria are typically more conservative for children than adults across the spectrum, whether it's cochlear implants or Bajas or things like that. And um, the author of the textbook here is making the argument that it's actually uh, you know, more critical for children to get implanted earlier for obvious reasons due to the nature of speech and language development. And that um, you know, maybe there'll be a push down the road and definitely that would be a positive thing if we can loosen up, the, if the criteria for children is loosened up so that even with better speech understanding performance that we can get more kids implanted uh, to see better developmental outcomes. Okay, so we've talked about speech recognition. That's one of the areas that cochlear implant candidacy is evaluated in for children. But the other area tied to speech recognition is auditory skill development. And that's going to be particularly more important for the youngest children because where you can't test speech recognition. So, for example, infants and then uh, some toddlers or many toddlers, I suppose. Um, so auditory skills are typically going to be assessed really through parent report, so caregiver report, whether that's through a more uh, like a structured interview or whether that's through an actual uh, questionnaire, uh, but we're looking at auditory-based responsiveness of the child or potentially language development and speech development as well. Um, some of the most popular questionnaires are going to be the it mace and the mace. Um, the it mace I-T-M-A-I-S, is just the infant-toddler version of the Meaningful Auditory Integration Scale. And you can easily do a Google search to come up with these. And the, many of these questionnaires are, are widely available from the implant manufacturers or even hearing aid companies. Another popular one is the Little Ears Auditory Questionnaire, which is uh, put out by Medel. So let me show you the it maze for a moment so you can kind of get an idea. It's a 10, 10 item uh, questionnaire. It's fairly open-ended questions. Um, let me see if I can pull that up for you and show you an example here. There we go. Uh, so we've got, uh, is the child child's vo vocal behavior affected while wearing his or her sensory aid? So in this case, cochlear implant. And then um, you can ask the parent to describe the child's vocalizations when you put his or her device in each day. Have the parent explain how and if the child's vocalizations change when the sensory aid is first turned on and auditory input is experienced. So it gives the um, uh, gives us some additional directions. It gives the clinician some additional directions in terms of how to ask the question or how to modify the question. And then you can see the some of the responses we can rate on a zero to four scale from never to always. And we also have some additional space for some uh, some comments by the parent. Another question here on the it mace. Does the child produce well-formed syllables and syllable sequences that are recognized as speech? So you, you kind of get the idea of what the it mace is getting at here. And then the textbook goes into some uh, variety of other scales. There's quite a few choices. There's also the auditory skills checklist, uh, which is really for those youngest children under 12 months, like we mentioned before. Uh, FDA doesn't FDA hasn't cleared children or hasn't approved uh, the criteria for children under 12 months, but it's still happening off label. And so, in in that case, the auditory skills checklist would be an excellent uh, questionnaire to use. It's about 35 items long, um, and that can be used in conjunction with the it mace. Some other questionnaires: the uh, FAPC, FAPCI, the functioning after pediatric cochlear implantation. More of an outcome measure, but of course you can get a baseline before implantation. There's the functional auditory performance indicators, uh, and the early language milestone scale. So the key thing is more important than the specific choice of questionnaires would be that there's consistency. It's not going to be one clinician choosing one questionnaire and your your colleague choosing another for their cochlear implant patients. You're probably going to want consistency for your given center or clinic where everybody's using the same types of outcome measures. So that you're, or, I'm sorry not outcome measures, uh, evaluation or candidacy measures uh, for the sake of standardization and consistency in the clinic. And certainly you may also need to evaluate uh, auditory skills in those older children, preschool to school age children. 
um, and there are a variety of questionnaires available, uh, parental questionnaires available for them. Uh, and we can see some examples here in this in this table. Uh, the appropriate age ranges in the second to last column from the right side. Um, many of these uh, questionnaires only go up to around seven years of age. Uh, we can see on the bottom the peach there goes up to seven years of age. Uh, so many of these are appropriate for preschool, but uh, not a not a whole lot beyond preschool. Because of the detrimental effect of severe or profound hearing loss, in particular on speech and language development in a child, many ca in many cases these uh, children, even with hearing aids on, will have uh, very be very delayed in terms of language development. So it's important for there to be a baseline speech and language evaluation early on, um, in, but in particular right around the start of the hearing aid trial. But Prior to that evaluation, uh, it should be verified that the hearing aids the child is trying, uh, it should be verified that they're using appropriate settings. This would include an appropriate pediatric prescription. That would include DSL-MIO or now NL2 pediatric version. And verification should occur at multiple input levels, soft, average, and loud. Um, whether this is in situ on the ear or uh, in the test box really depends on the age and cooperation of the child. Uh, recall that individual RECD should be measured because of the age-related um, intersubject vari inter-individual variability in uh, ear canal acoustics. So individual really or a couple of differences should definitely be verified or measured. Um, also, we want to. Uh, make sure that you use really aided responses, not insertion gain. Insertion gain is okay for adults. For children, we need to make sure to measure output at the eardrum, not insertion gain. Uh, and so once we have the verification that everything is, is looking good for, the, for that degree of hearing loss, speech language evaluation should commence. And then uh, potentially any auditory skills questionnaires can certainly be um, administered to the parent. Uh, towards the end of that three to six month hearing aid trial, you're going to want another speech language evaluation so we can try to establish, uh, you know, as well as maybe an auditory skills questionnaire to see if progress has, has occurred, and adequate progress is essentially month to month, uh, month for month progress. And what that means is for every, every month of hearing aid use, we would expect the equivalent. Uh, one month in uh, auditory development or speech language development. If the child is falling shy of that, significantly falling shy of that, that would be an indication that inadequate auditory and speech language development or progress is occurring and that cochlear implantation may be a uh, better option. In addition to the speech language pathologist, the uh, social worker and psychologist will also play a role or may potentially play a role with pediatric cochlear implant candidacy. Um, in particular, if there is any concern uh, with cognitive delays or deficits, intellectual disabilities or developmental, more global developmental issues, and this may be related to some uh, diagnose syndrome it may not be uh, but if there's concerns related to that it may be may be a good idea to have the parent seek a developmental psychological evaluation for the child so that the that information can be um, then passed on to the cochlear implant team to see how that will impact uh, recommendations to move forward or not with cochlear implants and then we also have um, other other roles the so psychologist and or social worker might play is that they may help the parents with coping with the child's diagnosis. Um, as we know, audiologists may counsel, but they are not professional counselors. And so either a licensed psychologist or a licensed clinical social worker uh, may help parents in this situation if, if, um, if, if the the difficulty they're having is maybe outside of the scope of what the audiologist can provide in terms of counseling support. And then social workers are also um, in a unique position to help families find out community resources or financial resources available to help with um, payment for services that the insurance company may not cover. So habilitation services, for example, that might be auditory and speech and language therapy post implant. Most cochlear implant surgeries would typically be performed by an otologist or neurotologist as opposed to a, um, a general otolaryngologist. 
Otolaryngologists typically compete, complete a, a one-year general surgery internship followed by four years in a uh, otolaryngology residency and those who go on to become otologists or neurotologists complete a further uh, say one to three years in a uh, neurootology fellowship and it's during that fellowship that most otologists or neurootologists uh, will begin to do cochlear implantation the physician will also make sure that each child is up to date on their immunizations and they may also recommend that the child receives uh, pneumococcal uh, vaccines there's a pneumococcal conjugate um, a couple different pneumococcal conjugate vaccines those are going to prevent against pneumococcal uh, infection uh, following surgery there's also a pre-anesthetic medical evaluation to make sure that the uh, child is is, uh, is is healthy enough to undergo surgery and healthy enough to withstand the effects of anesthesia. The uh, pre-anesthetic medical evaluation may be completed by an anesthesiologist or a uh, nurse anesthetist. The otologist may also uh, refer the child to other specialties, uh, in particular uh, ophthalmology, because and as well as medical genetics, because. Uh, about 40% of children with sensorineural hearing loss may have other comorbidities uh, that need to be treated by other specialties. Of course, the otologist would refer to other medical specialties as needed, including neurology, uh, rehabilitation specialist, developmental pediatrician, etc. The otologist would also uh, typically order CT or MRI imaging studies in order to make sure that uh, uh, cochlear patency uh, or to evaluate cochlear patency to make sure that uh, that there's not a partial or total obliteration of the cochlear uh, scale and also to make sure there are not any other uh, unusual temporal bone anomalies that might have an impact on electrode insertion and uh, ano having anomalies be present does not always uh, rule out cochlear implantation um, but in some cases it certainly would. For example, if there was a, a absence of a cochlea and entirely or absence of an auditory nerve, uh, that may present a problem. Similar to the uh, predictive variables that I talked about with adult cochlear implant candidacy, it's also of uh, considerable interest to know if there are certain, um, certain predictive factors that we can we can highlight or utilize in order to determine how, how well a child is likely to do post implantation. So there are some that we'll talk about here, age of implantation, uh, wear time, uh, type of intervention, pre-implant thresholds, uh, integrity of cochlear and neural structures. Earlier on I mentioned the, the textbook author's opinion that uh, there should be a move to uh, loosen up uh, implant criteria for children so they can be implanted uh, earlier on between six to nine months uh, right now that can happen but only off-label uh, so so right now what we know is that most studies that have compared I age of implantation for younger children versus older children on a variety of parameters have typically shown that the 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 earlier you're implanted, the better you typically do. Uh, there's been evidence to show that improved word learning occurs when implanted before 13 months, compared to another group where they were implanted between 16 and 23 months. Also improved language and vocabulary development for those children who are implanted between 18 and 24 months, compared to those who were implanted over two years. That's not to say that children implanted at greater than 18 to 24 months don't get benefit. They absolutely do. Uh, we can just see uh, greater benefit, faster development for children who are implanted earlier, and it may need more aggressive interventions or habilitation programs for those who are implanted later on in order to uh, catch up or achieve similar, similar uh, developmental milestones as those who've been implanted earlier. While age of implantation is, is very important, uh, arguably wear time uh, is even more important because if, if the child isn't wearing the processor, the cochlear implant processor, then no progress will be made. So if we make a comparison to normal hearing children, 
uh, we can see infants are typically wearing or listening to the environment around them around 10 hours a day, whereas toddlers and preschoolers are listening to the environment around them around 12 hours a day. With inconsistent use uh, of the implant processor um, or disuse of it, we can expect that inadequate progress will be made, uh, and that'll very likely be related to wear time. Um, data logging for the clinician, for the cochlear implant uh, audiologist. Data logging is oftentimes available in the cochlear implant manufacturer software so that you can uh, objectively track uh, processor usage or cochlear implant usage. Intervention is another important predictor variable uh, related to outcomes. Uh, the best auditory and language outcomes are associated with with uh, intervention that begins early and is consistent. Uh, and these intervention programs that are ideal are going to uh, be multifaceted, and they're typically going to include uh, typical speech and language therapy, hopefully a speech language pathologist that has experience working with uh, cochlear implantees uh, previously. Also, these home-based infant family services, so what comes to mind would be something like uh, Rainbows United, what we have here locally in Wichita. Uh, Parent-infant programs, these may be available through larger implant centers where they're, uh, can, where they're performing uh, quite a few cochlear implant surgeries per year. They may have these parent-infant programs available. Uh, any particular specialized language and listening pre preschools, really these are uh, focused on children who are hard of hearing. So the availability of these will, of course, vary depending on what area you're in. If you're in a very rural area and you had to um, travel a distance to the cochlear implant center, then you can expect that many of these services may not be available locally. And um, uh, that's where it's things like the John Tracy Clinic may come in handy in order for, uh, to provide uh, resources or online resources. Uh, if you're in a larger metropolitan area, certainly that you may have greater access to these types of services. Not surprisingly, the integrity of uh, the cochlear and neural structures associated with audition uh, can certainly play a role in outcomes. Uh, the percentage of children with sensory neural hearing loss that also have some of these uh, structural ab abnormalities is fairly high. It's been reported to be as high as 35 percent. Some of the more common abnormalities that can be seen with imaging studies uh, include Mondini dysplasia, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, uh, treated internal auditory canal, uh, common cavity, um, so, but these are not necessarily contraindications to surgery. There have been a variety of case reports that show that those with Bondini dysplasia can do well with cochlear implants. Those with enlarged vestibular aqueduct syndrome can do okay too. They may have uh, greater incidence of complications like uh, cerebrospinal fluid gushers, uh, but they can still do well. Um, uh, then cochlear nerve deficiency kind of uh, deserves its own, own little area here to talk about. So uh, cochlear nerve deficiency can typically be diagnosed on either CT or MRI. Um, this is going to be when the nerve is either absent or hypoplastic, so essentially underdeveloped. Um, if the nerve is completely absent, well, cochlear implantation cannot proceed, uh, would not be effective at all, so it would be contraindicated. If the nerve is simply hypoplastic, and there's the possibility that you could proceed with it, but outcomes would likely be poorer than, uh, than the case where there isn't that structural abnormality. There's also the case of uh, true auditory neuropathy, which is um, confusing when we consider it, uh, you know, the term as it relates to auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. So a true auditory neuropathy is where uh, either there are other peripheral neuropathies uh, that are present in other, uh, say for example, cranial nerves, or when there is a uh, known uh, association with a certain uh, condition like a Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. While the uh, textbook author indicates that a uh, true auditory neuropathy would um, would preclude cochlear implant candidacy because the auditory nerve is not fully intact. Uh, 
there have been case reports on somewhat as successful uh, successful cochlear implantations in charcot Marie tooth disease. So, you know, take that as you will. With certain types of hearing loss, uh, we know that there will be a relationship between etiology and outcomes. Uh, similar to what I mentioned with uh, adult cochlear implant candidacy with adults, with his re uh, there was a relationship, and also with children, there was a relationship. Uh, for in children, about 6% of uh, acquired cases of sensory neural hearing loss are, sec are related to meningitis. Uh, about 5 to 10 percent of uh, cases of bacterial meningitis in children will result in severe to profound loss. Um, and that's really partly why uh, the, the otologist uh, really wants the, the children to receive those pneumococcal conjugate vaccines to reduce the incidence of bacterial meningitis uh, post-implantation. Um, also, uh, due to ossification of that cochlea following meningitis, Cochlear implantation should proceed much sooner rather than later, so you may see a, definitely a shortened hearing aid trial. However, compared to average uh, outcomes, cochlear implantation in meningitis typically is going to be poor outcomes due to um, incomplete insertion of the electrode array. Uh, certain electrodes may, may not be effective uh, because of the ossification as well. Then certain syndromes that have uh, sequelae in addition to uh, hearing loss may also have a, uh, may also have an impact on outcomes so for example those conditions like ushers or refsum's uh, disease that have vision loss as a comorbidity that may impact speech and language development because children rely heavily on on visual cues for speech and language in particular when they have uh, more severe degrees of hearing loss so it'd be best to implant those children um, before the onset of vision loss when you know there's a certain syndrome that has vision loss as a uh, as a comorbidity especially when it's progressive or it's later onset like ushers um, also those conditions uh, some of those conditions like charge for example uh, may have an impact on kind of global developmental or cognitive uh, deficits and, and those can be related to poor outcomes so uh, expectations should be mediated by by knowledge of the given syndrome there's also a certain chromosome related uh, deafness can have an impact so etiology here it can have an impact we know the most common one that we think about would be trisomy 21 or down syndrome that that uh, basically and um, down syndrome uh, about 5%, less than 5% of cases of Down syndrome will have severe to profound hearing loss, so not terribly common. Uh, but expectations for outcomes should also be related to cognitive status. We know with Down syndrome, there is a, a fairly wide range of cognitive uh, status, and so uh, there should be a relationship there. And because of the, the, the predisposition uh, of those with Down syndrome to acquire middle ear disease, definitely those uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines should be uh, stressed with with, uh, with that particular condition. Well, that's all I've got for the uh, pediatric cochlear implant candidate selection. Stay tuned for future lectures here.